let me thank you all for coming. And um, I'd like to go over just a couple of ground rules before we start. And uh, the primary one is be skeptical. He's going to come back up. Okay. I'm talking about ground rules. Skeptical. And what I said in some of the little announcements that you may have read, we'll talk about bacteria, why all some of the new bacterial enthusiasm, you know, every little health journal and in magazines and stuff. A lot of you probably know what the microbiome is uh, and why it's increasingly significant in clinical care. Uh, so we'll take a good look at bacteria, some of the terms that describe bacteria. As I said in the little script, let's be really clear about probiotics and prebiotics, significant health difference. And then we'll take a look at plant-based nutrition. Uh, and let me mention that I have one significant visual aid. And there are no slides, there are no, no handouts, no screen with every sentence I say already up on the screen. We're <laughs> glad for that. <laughs> this is the visual aid. <laughs> You won't understand the full significance until we get a little farther along. But that's an important one to keep in mind. A little bit about bacteria. Um, you can't see them. On the end of Magdalena's pen, there are probably over 10,000 bacteria on the point. On the point. And scientists probably know it's a tiny fraction of the names of them. It's a one off. Okay. Um, they're everywhere in the, in the ground, in the leaves, in the light, and certainly everywhere in the human body. Um, estimates vary depending on what research you read, but anywhere between 50 and 100 trillion. 100 trillion bacteria. It's hard for human beings to even comprehend a trillion, especially a trillion dollars. But a hundred trillion things that you can't even see all over our scalp, our ears, our, our nose, our crannies and crevices, our mouth, all over our bodies, bacteria. And a very, very important job constantly all over us. Um, primarily in digestion. Uh, there are bacteria that take care of things in your mouth and begin the digestion of food. But 70%, 70% of our bacteria reside in our gut, in the last part of our large intestine. Let's think of the large intestine as an upside down U, like this. This is the ascending colon, transverse colon, and the descending colon. The descending colon, about 70% of all the bacteria. Okay. Diseases of inflammation. We're beginning to hear more and more about that everywhere. Diseases of inflammation. Diseases of what area? I, this thing is really annoying. People want to work there. Just think about it. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Diseases of inflammation. Diseases of inflammation. Okay. Diseases of inflammation. The reason I'm here talking about bacteria is that for quite a while I had a long bout with a disease of inflammation. Uh, a terminal illness that got tighter and tighter and tighter, or what can I say, closer and closer and closer, until it became pretty darn important to find out more about what was going on. Um, I went down to the Dartmouth Medical School Library, and with the help of some of the research librarians there, just really dug in. Um, 
to find out a lot more about my own disease and inflammation and what might correct it, what might stop it. Uh, not every physician agrees with the decisions that I've made, but I would point to the fact that after 41 years on antibiotics, an unbelievable number of visits to emergency rooms um, all over the country, I, for three years, have been no visits to emergency rooms and no antibiotics. So there's a lot of fascinating stuff that can emerge from understanding this bacteria every day. Where do they come from? Where the heck did bacteria get started? When human beings came out of the trees, let's focus on Africa here. Hundreds of thousands of years ago, there are three or four other relatives of the human being very close to ourselves. The great ape, the bonobos, other types of monkeys, other types of homos, there are different levels of things that look an awful lot like us, but for one or two genes. And the bacteria have been with us for those hundreds of thousands of years. And where did Homo sapiens, us humans, really take off? Part was learning how to walk, knowing how to walk upright, and the eastern, the savannah of eastern Africa. And the bacteria have been with us all along, doing their incredible jobs at keeping us healthy. And acknowledge the fact that bacteria are selfish in their own way, all 100 trillion. They get fed, they get protected, they get free transportation, and they're all focused on keeping us well. Certain bacteria have a bad name, and it's anti antibiotics. Not all bacteria cooperate and contribute to our health. But basically, the bacteria are an amazing, what's called a commensal, a cooperative community of strains and genetic groups and families of bacteria that work together as a team, that work together as a team, particularly in your gut, or let me say, especially in your gut. Okay. Some words to help help us move a little farther along in terms of understanding the bacteria in our body and how it keeps us healthy. Well, dysbiosis is kind of a key one to to know. It's just a fancy word for inflammation. And dysbiosis is when the bacteria don't work together as a team. It's an amazingly sophisticated cooperative, <laughs> cooperative effort. And just one particular task, let me describe The role of bacteria in controlling permeability, permeability, the infiltration, the ability to move through uh, your gut wall, bacteria control. There we go. <laughs> bacteria control what gets through your gut wall and into your bloodstream. Food gets through, immune cells get through. Uh, I'll think of it in a minute. The cells that can actually talk to our brain. Um, and they get permission from this teams of bacteria working together on the gut wall 
It's okay. You can get into the bloodstream. You can do food. You can be a neurotransmitter. Uh, you can be an immune cell. And if the bacteria, this is this is the gut wall. Uh, if the bacteria aren't working carefully, and really, what can I say, healthily together, they fall down on their job of maintaining the integrity of that gut wall. And what gets through? Well, the causes of rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, secondary sclerosing cholangitis, which I can describe if you want, um, who plays a huge, huge role in obesity, lupus, Crohn's, well, we'll get there, oh, sorry. acne, <laughs> when you think of all the things that we put on our face as adolescents, on the outside, really taking care of your bacteria and preserving the integrity of that wall or reestablishing that now on, on the part of adolescents, the same though. It's an, an amazing transformation and to see before and after photos of people who work taking care of their bacteria and what that's able to do. It, it, it's a significant wake-up call. Selena mentioned a whole range of, well, basically inflammatory bowel disease. You've got Crohn's, you've got ulcerative colitis, and very common um, and really tough illnesses for which a lot of physicians will prescribe antibiotics, which further upset the bacteria that are maintaining the wall. And if you could make those bacteria healthy again, you can step past. You can, let me be clear, cure many of those diseases of inflammation. So where do we, where do we really begin to make a difference? Think of keeping your bacteria healthy. How do you maintain that teamwork? How do you feed bacteria? Bacteria last less than a day. Some of them last only an hour. And they're constantly, constantly uh, through nuclear fission just reproducing. About 70% of what's in our poop is old bacteria. Uh, it's, they're just working. If you had a microphone of some kind, you'd hear an amazing engine, I'm sure. What do you feed bacteria? Have you ever heard anybody tell you what to feed bacteria? What do bacteria eat? They're, they're less than an hour. A hundred trillion. They're maintaining the gut wall. They're sending transmission up and down the vagus nerve. They're sending out immune cells to go after that little cut you've got out in the bramberry bushes. There's all kinds of things happening. Where does that energy come from? Fiber. Uh, now I've heard about fiber. I, you know, I have wheat checks or something. Anyway, everybody's <laughs> got their idea of what what fiber is. Uh, the kind of fiber that feeds your bacteria, and this is so essential, in particularly in the modern Western world, meat has no fiber. Dairy, milk, cheese. Yogurt, no fiber. Wow, how are we going to get fiber to feed those bacteria? You've got your upper GI tract 
in their lower GI tract. Their upper GI tract will go after the ice cream cone, the Hershey bar, the really rich sugary stuff, and it gets digested in a flash, and it doesn't get down into your colon as it's already digested. And if you have, I was looking at the same shelf for these things. There are eight or nine others that are loaded with sugar and honey and God knows what else. Um, let me digress just for a moment. You're back on the savannah in eastern Africa and it's 100,000 years ago. And what have you got that you can eat, rely on to have any time you really need it? There's probably not much dairy. Zip. There's no sugar. The occasional honey pie, maybe. There's extraordinarily little meat. Essentially none. This is a desert. If you look at a great ape, our, our ancestor, what do they do for 13 hours a day? They eat leaves. They eat leaves. They eat greens. They eat some of the wonderful things that's in the little delicatessen, uh, you know, the food things downstairs. It's an incredible assortment of really healthy green stuff. Um, that's what human beings ate for the first several hundred thousand years. And sugar? That's unheard of until, I don't know when it began, 1900. When did everybody have all the sugar they wanted? Hershey started that. Um, okay, we're coming back to fiber. You need non-digestible, non-digestible, what's called a polysaccharide, and that's just a fancy name for a short chain sugar. What are these? They're in all the things your grandmother told you to eat. Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, spinach, artichokes, asparagus, uh, name any vegetable you can think of, bananas. These have <coughs> digestible fiber, some there that can be sweet, but they have the non-digestible fiber that gets through your upper GI tract with a hydrochloric acid bath that takes care of any errant germ that shouldn't get down into the rest of your system. But this fiber can get past that gate, it's into your colon, and what happens? Through fermentation, the bacteria break down that short chain fatty acid. And hang on your hat, we won't go into this too much. In the short chain fatty acids, there are three critical short chain fatty acids, just food for bacteria. And with enough fiber, the bacteria will, through fermentation, make abundant, uh, um, what's what I say, many of these short chain fatty acids that they use as their own food, and it's the food for the cells of the gut wall. If, uh, if I do this, I'm underlining something. It is also the food for the cells of the gut wall. Okay. And there are different estimates, but a fairly consistent one is about 97% of North Americans do not get anywhere near adequate fiber. And we have this incredible range of inflammatory illnesses that are just, what shall I say, the figures are just going like this. Obesity is certainly a part of it. Um, type 2 diabetes is part of it. Uh, fiber, 
fibromyalgia, or whatever they call it, something myalgia, which is part of an, an inflammatory disease. What's what's getting inflamed? What's what's where's the flame? Where's the problem? The gut wall is inflamed. The gut wall is often in certain. Um, or shall I say, colonic disorders, it, it bleeds. It just is really a very tender sore, like a cut on your arm. And what's part of the reason that bacteria are not getting fed? The bacteria are not able to make the short-chain fatty acids that not only feed the gut wall, but feed the bacteria themselves who are amazingly strict patrol officers, control officers, of what gets into your bloodstream. I'll name one, just for the fun, so you know I can at least say the name of one of the bacteria. Ackermansia mucinophila. Okay, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Ackerman, Dr. Ackerman discovered, ah, Ackermansia. Mm -hmm. And mucinophila means that it it likes and supports mucin. Well, mu it's basically mucilage. There are two very, very fine, basically mucus walls um, as part of that gut wall. And what keeps them selective and very, very specific about what they let through? <coughs> Is Ackermansia mucinophila. That's the, one of the bacteria that's critical for that team that works in the gut wall. So we come back to <coughs> feeding our bacteria. You can do it easily at every meal. And I can't, I can't promise results, but if you're <coughs> not eating at the moment with a lot of sources of really good non-digestible bacteria. So chances are you <laughs> see a lot of very healthy changes. Let me say if you're if you haven't had a lot of fiber in your nutrition for a while, go easy on the Brussels sprouts and the asparagus and the Jerusalem artichokes or some of the things that you know have a lot of fiber. Go easy. And fiber, I have to get used to having a, a full plate and slowly repair the cells of the gut wall. The gut wall is one epithelial cell thick. They only last a little less than a day. We've got bacteria that are turning over some as quickly every hour. The cells at the back of the colon wall in less than a day. Again, if we had the mic down there listening to that rumble, it would be an avalanche of things happening. And the energy involved there that we don't really think about, energy is here, energy is here. What's going on in our gut is phenomenally. Demanding of, of good food, of, of, of good nutrition. You're going to provide the fiber, provide the short chain fatty acids that feed that gut wall and the bacteria themselves. Let me step into probiotics and prebiotics. When I dug in at the Dartmouth Medical School Library, um, a lot of things sort of popped up very quickly. What the heck are prebiotics? And I tried it out on a couple of doctors who um, very tenderly corrected me and said, no, 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 Eric, you mean probiotics. And I realized that I was in a 
on a road that many doctors haven't taken yet, I'll be as kind as I can. Um, it's a new field. Most of the information that you get, most of the books that have been currently written about it are based on mice, are based on the research that's happened in mice. And what you do find related to human beings is profound. The difference is incredible. Uh, the differences that can be made. I mentioned uh, adolescence and acne, uh, lupus erythematosus. My brother is a physician, uh, works with, a lot with plants and plant-based and high-fiber diets. And his classic, and the, these are the kinds of things that science and medicine generally dismisses as the spontaneous remission. And my brother lectures a lot in various countries about plant-based nutrition, has a lot of physicians in his audience, um, works a lot with public health people in different countries. And his classic example is a physician, a woman physician in her early 30s, who had multiple sclerosis. It developed somewhere in her 20s, in a wheelchair, the kind of person that, can I say it, President Trump would mock at a rally. And this physician heard some of this, not so much the strong emphasis uh, on bacteria per se, but on the fiber in plant-based nutrition. And Essie, my brother, <laughs> has been in touch with this woman and will happily show you the film of her second 10K. Wow. She's, what we're transforming here is a permeable gut wall with constant stuff coming out that doesn't belong. In rheumatoid arthritis, in multiple sclerosis, something gets into your joints. Uh, in my case, there were continual things that landed in the, in the liver. Uh, there are bacteria that if they get out and get away from this community where everybody's kept under control, there are bacteria that get out and nibble on the insulation of nerves, the myelin, the myelin cover on a nerve. There are certain, we'll call them bad guys, pathogens. As long as they're there and in this community where there's somebody keeping an eye on things, those pathogens don't don't exercise any damage, don't do any damage there. They get out into the bloodstream through a permeable, a weak gut wall, and zingo. The lupus, the acne, secondary sclerosing cholangitis, MS, uh, type 2, diabetes, and I don't want to overdo this, but nutrition plays a significant role in Alzheimer's. And you know, you're getting, if you want, there's an overwhelming scientific research supporting that. And we've all got friends or relatives or, or people we know who are drifting into Alzheimer's. And everybody says, well, it comes with old age. And it, it does. But it begins when we're in our 30s and 40s. And nutrition can, can condition, uh, nutrition may play a role. I don't want to drop that in anybody's head. But it's, it's there. It's important in every part, every aspect of our health. Um, probiotics, prebiotics. In all deference to the folks who work here, 
there are six shelves down there, each one 40 feet long. And you can find a probiotic for people who are left-handed, a probiotic for people who are under 16 and right-handed, probiotic for golfers, probiotic for the postmenopausal woman, postpon you know, probiotic for golfers. There is absolutely no federal control of any sort over the quality of probiotics. Most of the studies I've read show that about 60% of them probably don't have what they claim to have on the label. And they have an enormous emotional effect that helps some people. I've taken, I took antibiotics for 41 years. And a lot of people said, oh, I've got to take probiotics to reduce the impact of your antibiotics. The antibiotics were to knock out some pretty nasty things in my gut. Now, I never took any probiotics in a sense creating competition for what the antibiotics were supposed to do. But you will often hear somebody say, well, take probiotics and, well, okay. Let's look at what probiotics are. Divide bacteria into two major classes. There are some that live in air. There are aerobic bacteria. They can thrive in air. And then there are anaerobic, anaerobes, bacteria that don't, cannot survive in the air. Okay, everything inside there is an anaerobe. It's an anaerobe that doesn't work in oxygen. Okay, there are a few. Remember, we've got a hundred trillion, and there are a few bacteria that live in air and have the yogurt folks worked on those. You can <laughs> look at the labels and see again and again and again this tiny group of bacteria that can be pushed and mulled and mixed with blueberries and sugar and cream and everything else. They'll survive in, in a big food factory. Those, that's a very limited group of the whole extended family. Okay, remember we've got 100 trillion, and I'm gonna take some probiotics to, because I'm over 50. And it says on the label, over 5 billion live organisms are alive. I've forgotten the term at the moment. 5 billion, okay, so we've got this many already there working together and we're going to pour in five billion uh, with the dubious reputations i would point out um, so it's an uphill slog the european union does not allow anybody to make any health claims whatsoever about probiotics nor does the national health plan in england um, america's a little more robust about some of those things. However, take a good look at what, what's, what's there. Realize that it's a very, very small select group of bacteria and recognize that its impact, you know, a grain of sand in the gravel bank. And if it makes you feel better, do it. But be aware that uh, the placebo effect on probiotics is probably one of its strongest uh, parts from its strongest selling points. And there are a lot of people who beat me about the head and shoulders for those remarks, but I think they're accurate, scientifically accurate. What the heck are prebiotics? That's, those are the fibers. Probiotics, just more of the same. Prebiotics, getting something in your gut that the bacteria can use to provide their own food. And where are the prebiotics down? They're not in that 40-foot shelf 
with all the fancy labels and all the numbers and all the fancy names like Ackermancy and Eucinophila. Um, step out into the fruit section. All the colors there. Um, look at the vegetables. Look at all the incredible greens. That's that's where the fiber is. That's where the fiber you want is. And as much as you can, mix the colors. Get the colors, the different colors. Why the different colors? What you're getting, one of the important things you're getting out of fruit, getting out of fruit and vegetables and berries, and almonds and pumpkin seeds and oats, are phyto plant phytonutrients. We're back on the savanna in Eastern Africa. What are we going to eat? What have our bacteria been used to for hundreds of thousands of years? Nuts, seeds, plants. And where are they? They're in the fresh veggie section, the fresh fruit section. There are a few exceptions, but if it comes in a box, watch out. <laughs> we'll get to this later. <laughs> um, one of the ground rules that I mentioned was be skeptical. The other ground rule is if you've got something on your mind or something that I've presented that you'd like me to amplify at all or expand a bit or describe more fully or go over it again, Feel free to ask a question. Push me hard. Um, the only reason I'm here, I was an English major. The only reason I'm here is because the game was about over and it was time to dig a little deeper than clinical care had been able to go at that point. And my information, since July, 2016, and a wonderful helping research librarian at the Dartmouth Medical School. Um, okay, no questions. Let's move into the next. I think there's this one thing that you, you said to me that was that really clarifying. <clears throat> so here we are eating meat and all the things that don't have fiber. And gradually the bacteria get hungrier and hungrier, and the one thing that these gut walls is made of is fiber. So the bacteria start eating this, the gut wall and making holes in it. Like leaky gut. Leaky gut. Yeah. Oh. And uh, that was so clear to me. I, oh, I see how that works. Yeah. And only uh, the other thing you said to me is only the last hundred years we've had um, chemicals, high sugars, high salts, and it's it's hitting our bodies with this great change and we, we're not we haven't evolved that fast so mm -hmm. the fi more fiber you can do the better actually your cousins uh i mean your or <laughs> your brother was saying if you actually grab a handful of kale six times a day and just gobble it down like <laughs> seeds like like pills you would be very very healthy i don't <laughs> care because it just it gives you so much fiber so fast and the jerusalem artichokes my kids call them fartichokes, but they're, they're really um, very full of fiber. Yeah. It's been a merry chase. It's been a merry chase. Um, I have a question, too. Can you clarify good versus bad bacteria? Sure. Okay. Stand by. Because we always hear about, you know, bacteria versus viruses causing illnesses. Okay, virus is very different. You're right, but I'm talking about bacteria. Okay. That's, you know, two things. Come back to the word commensal, cooperative, working together, community. And scientists have just, just begin to name some of these bacteria. They've got a long list to check out. And there are a lot of pathogens. Pathogens are the bad guys. Disease-causing, infection-causing, uh, bad actors. 
that ones that might take the lining off uh, the nerve fiber, ones that may uh, in rheumatoid arthritis or, or uh, multiple sclerosis interfere with the synovial fluid in your joints. Those are clearly bad actors. They all, they all dwell, this sounds a little like a child care training center, but they all get along beautifully when they're together. And the, the classic is yeast. Having <laughs> a little bit of IV antibiotics, I can tell you about yeast. Yeast are sort of in, in the mix. They're comfortably walking along with everybody else. But if suddenly the crowd gets thinner or the line gets shorter, yeast take over. And they will go to every opening and crevice and place in your body because the community has been upset by a dysbiosis and upset because the bacteria have killed off, the uh, antibiotics have killed off so many critical partners in this cooperating village that the bad guys, in this case yeast, take over and they venture way outside your, your gut. Uh, and that's an example of a pathogen, of, of bad, it isn't bad per se, we use yeast in other ways and in some foods, but if it's not cooperating in that commensal community of an amazing variety of different bacteria, it can rear its ugly head. And there are others that I can't think of. I don't... But yeast is a bad bacteria. It causes a bacterial illness. Is that what you're, I'm, I'm really mixed up about when we get antibiotics because we have a bacterial illness. So, so, so you've had a blood culture and it shows that you've got bacteria in your blood. Right. Okay. And you'll get the nuclear response. And then they'll give you, well, I'm saying a lot of kids get, get antibiotics because they have a bacterial illness. And I guess, yeah, they test for it or suspect it or I don't know why. But. It's, it's often suspect mm -hmm. when I think of my kids growing up. Right and the amoxicillin that they got in these little mm -hmm. tubes because there was a possible earache. Right. That, and God, no pediatrician wants to face a genuine ear infection. And just to be safe, so that has a profound impact on especially kids under the age of three. But we won't, we won't go there. But, um, and, and, and Antibiotics saved his life. Don't get you know he he had to have them at one point, but you just you just mm -hmm. can't sit on them because you you lose all the balance. That's certainly what for forty years doctors thought was the answer. Um, are you okay then? Mm -hmm. Okay. The, use the use the uh, the analog of, of a village. And there's some pretty mean, snotty kids down there on the other side of town. But because everybody else works and the school works and you know there's a church supper and everybody's working together, they don't upset things very much. But if there are a lot of antibiotics and the superintendent and the the guy on the corner who keeps his eye on kids. And I'm trying to make a metaphor for a community that's got, nobody's ever perfect, but it, it, Balance. it functions smoothly. And it performs an enormous number of jobs. Remember, it's the immune cells. It's the neurotransmitters. Over half the messages going up and down our vagus nerve are, are gut, 
giving emotional messages to our brain. Do you ever, what can I say, get a rumbly stomach before you have to give a talk about food at the, at the Hunger Mountain Co-op? <laughs> uh, and, or, in anticipation of some big event, like, I don't know, your daughter's wedding, do you ever get a rumbly tummy? You, the mom. I mean, think of all the link between emotions and mostly digestive feelings. And the classic uh, phrase that underscores this forever is, I've got a gut feeling. <laughs> I've got a gut feeling. We sure do. And it's constantly being monitored. Uh, okay. Prebiotics are feeding your bacteria. Probiotics are throwing in some extra villagers that you've got somewhere to go in there and influence the other 100 trillion villagers who are already there. You've got my bias. That's okay. Um, let's really take a hard look at plant-based nutrition. Um, anybody here would say that they're plant-based pretty much? Okay. Um, well, I, I, did, I did for a year, but um, I found out that I was totally depleted of B12. But that's another reason why I was. It wasn't, even if I had a supplement, it, it wasn't the cure. So, but I didn't find that out until afterwards. So, you know, I'm supposed to eat liver. You? But. <laughs> <laughs> I love liver. <laughs> well, I, I used to liver. For some very complex reasons about the fact that I don't have many organs left. I, want, like, I give myself B12 and the thigh. Oh, you can give yourself. Um, um, that allows me not. One of the shortcomings of a, of a uh, plant based diet can be in the absence of B12, mm -hmm. which huh. is essential. Sorry, you, you really need B12. And probably a capsule or some way. If you can absorb it, uh, find out what way to get it. You can always put it in your. Yeah. Fly every first of every month. <laughs> um, the biggest killer of men and women in America and most Western nations by far is heart, heart attacks. <coughs> Somebody dies every six seconds or something in this country or every six minutes. It's just and I've got friends who are aglow with stents. Um, caused by what are the building blocks of a heart attack? What are the building blocks of coronary artery disease or arteries of the heart itself or arteries in general? How do you get these little gelatinous plaques? What, what causes them? They're present in babies that have died and have been autopsy. You've begun, you can find in Western countries the beginning of atherosclerotic plaques in kids that aren't even born yet because of what their moms eat. Okay. What are the building blocks? What, what keeps three hard bypass surgeons up in Burlington chugging away, rebuilding the arteries around somebody's heart? Too much meat? <laughs> okay, the building blocks. 2% milk. Saturated <laughs> fat. Two percent milk. Where you, they break up the fat, and it's small. It's 
small Homo enough to still go through. Yeah, homogenized. Milk. Right. Where the, it, if it was just like whole milk, I hate milk, but if it was whole milk, it, it, the fat is bigger, so it's not going to perhaps oh. get, you know, stuck. stuck. <laughs> huh. Whole, whole milk is certainly one of the building blocks. Oh, yeah. Well, what I meant skim milk, I thought, was worse because they break the fat up. You know, it's 2% fat. That's just not to drink milk, period. I don't yeah. drink milk because yeah. I, I, I don't really like I need to lie down. Can I lie down right here? Oh, sure. Please. Oh, do you want to lie on the, on the yes, table? Yes, I'm going to just have to lie down on the floor. Oh. The table will work, Lauren. Can I? What, 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 what have we done? There's a table behind you that you could probably. She needs to lie down because mm -hmm. of that. She lie down for a minute. Thank you. Can I help you get on the table? Thank you. I can do it myself. Thank you. We have choir tonight. So. Yeah, we'll yes. uh, you do it with something. Here I go. Thank you. No, it's, it's starting now. But we have this wonderful the the pillow. Mm -hmm. The warm blanket will be coming in a moment. No, I don't need it. I'm warm. But that's something. Sorry. Yeah. So you're saying that you've heard that whole milk, um, and then one or two percent. If, if, if one was going to drink milk, mm -hmm. like for, you know, I was talking to George Woodard, who is in Waterbury Center. Mm -hmm. I don't know, if it, but he he's part of a co-op with organic milk mm -hmm. with organic dairy, mm -hmm. and he, we were just talking. To, I don't drink milk because I don't like it, but he was he was saying that if it's there's homogenized Jason and pasture Jason. Pasteurizing. So if it's minimally pasteurized, not homogenized, apparently okay. it's less dangerous yeah. than usual. That's what I was saying. Well, that's interesting because that's what I think we all, that's, I grew up eating, drinking four glasses of, you know, un, unhomogenized milk a day, whole milk. And what? so far, I only had a heart attack. Yeah. Of course, it's not part of a plant based diet. But it's not plant based, but it's just interesting no. the, the, the difference between whole milk and skim milk. Essie and I grew up on a dairy farm. I, I go back to the days of 40 gallon cans. Um, I had milk by the time, probably until I was in my 20s, uh, and discovered beer. Uh, <laughs> the building blocks, cholesterol and fat, and uh, uh, it's sacrilegious to say this in Vermont, but dairy is, I don't care what anybody says, you know, that it's grass fed or it's organic or no, it's loaded, loaded with saturated fat. And nothing tastes better than cheese. Mm. I know. Butter. That's the hard part. Yeah. yeah. Oh, to, to let so, it. My question is, okay, uh, what about... Magdalena, I can't yes. hear you. Some voices just don't. Yes, what about keeping your bone healthy? Oh, calcium. yes, the calcium. Calcium. The, the calcium part. Calcium part. For bones. The calcium. The bones. Keeping your bones healthy. If we can get it from from the day, probably, uh, how do we? You surely get calcium from other things. Okay, that's a way to know. There are cultures that don't have milk at all. Okay, that's. That I, I, the fruits, the vegetables, the nuts, the seeds. Very good. You know, Leafy greens. There's. Broccoli. I can't off the top of my head say spinach has calcium, but I'm sure there are a number of green vegetables that have calcium. It's, it's so again, the, from the plant food. But yes. Let me just make it clear, and it, since this is public television in Vermont, I will probably get hate letters by tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can do very, very well without any dairy, and to just drop it, the ice cream, the cheese, the cheese, the milk, just, no, 
we're getting rid of one of huge saturated fat and saturated fat's role in heart health is clear and in brain health why do we why don't we have giraffe milk or buffalo milk <laughs> hippopotamus milk good question no what the heck are we doing you can go to Mongolia and you can go to the hills of Monrovia or somewhere and look at the cheese and the cultures they've had for hundreds of years and they don't use the milk until after the calf is off the mom for several months or something. So that the really big hormone load that is turning that calf into a 400 pound bigger calf that goes to the calf. Uh, there's so many reasons to avoid uh, milk. Okay. Heart attacks and strokes. I, I just added strokes. Heart attacks and strokes. If I can say this from because I've read it so many times at this point. But cholesterol level, your overall cholesterol level, of less than 150 essentially makes you heart attack proof. Heart attack yeah. proof. Not, not a bad, not a bad. But, but let's say someone has like 200 or 225, but their, but their HDL is 100 and their triglycerides are 60. <laughs> <laughs> there's, I mean, there's exceptions. Right. <laughs> <laughs> We're let, me, let, me, let me acknowledge and graciously acknowledge. I'm sure there are exceptions. Let me let me say that in 1994, Bill Castelli, the second annual conference on the elimination of coronary artery disease, Buena Vista, Florida, put on by the president of Disney, with people from all over the world, because he had a heart attack. And so he set aside there one of his hotels down at Disneyland, Disney mm. World, whatever it is, in Florida. People from all over the world. <laughs> a lot of people who were heart surgeons were there. And Bill Castelli, who was William Castelli? He's retired now. He was director of the longest longitudinal health study in the world. What's called the Framingham Study in Massachusetts. Just following generation after generation, after generation, after generation of this community, basically, of related people in Framingham, Mass. This is Bill Castelli. This is a bunch of heart surgeons out there. This is the plenary session he's at. He asks questions. And Castelli says, well, in all our records, and, and I, we've never seen a heart attack in anybody with a cholesterol under 150. And the inhalation in the audience practically took the curtains off the wall. <laughs> These are the heart surgeons. Dr. Castelli, do you mean that a cholesterol of under 150 renders someone heart attack proof? This is Castelli. That's exactly what I mean. <laughs> uh, these are the guys with the facts. These are the guys with the facts. It's been proven again and again and again that you can eliminate coronary arteries, the blockage of arteries in your heart with plant-based nutrition. It took years of this kind of fight in Medicare Medicare is happy to pay 54,000 bucks for a high therapist. No problem. If a doctor says, this patient coming in, you've got pretty advanced, you know, some arteries that are pretty clogged here. But we can take care of that with nutrition. Medicare will now pay the doctor to give that message to heart patients. Oh, really? Hmm. really? It's not 54,000 bucks. No. But it's the great breakthrough 
in terms of doctors who are perhaps a little less aggressive. Uh, anyway, I shouldn't say. It's there, it's big business, and it's a lot of... It's expensive. <laughs> You're gonna, gonna go? We have three, yeah, we're late. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Hi everybody. Bye. Thanks for coming. So when you have cholesterol, how and you have a high cholesterol, how do you get rid of that? By eating how do you a plant-based. Does it does it ever go away once it's okay? Let me be again be very candid. There is a disease called hypercholesteremia. People who have a hard time processing cholesterol and have naturally, consistently high cholesterol. I, I, again, I, a study of one, you, you can take cholesterol from well over 150 to 83. Just by avoiding cholesterol. So, you, so, so what the main sources are me. A lot of sources are meat. Oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> you doing okay? I'm doing fine. Okay. Thank you. I'm really well. Pat Barb on the shoulder. She just needs a little TLC. Just pat her gently on the right shoulder. No, no you don't need that. <laughs> 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 I just have to lie down. After years and years and years in hospitals, oh, the most powerful true. medication there is, is vitamin H. Oh. And when a doctor comes in the morning after you've had a difficult night, and just puts his hand on your leg and says, you know, how are we doing today? That's worth six carloads of antibiotics. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let me come back to your question about if you've got a persistent and stubborn uh, cholesterol level, find out a little more. I mean, if it's really, if you're really playing the game with sticks and twigs. Uh, <laughs> the grains, the fruit, the nuts, uh, the, the oatmeal. So it can correct? It'll correct? Oh, gosh, yes. Okay. Oh, okay. It, it will correct right. massively okay. if you don't feed them. If you, if you, let me use this term building blocks again. Look back to heart attacks and strokes. The building blocks for those atherosclerotic plaques, the, the filmy, gelatinous stuff that builds up in your arteries, your body makes cholesterol. It makes all the cholesterol it needs. And when you get more than your body needs, it, it builds up. Let's go back to the heart. Three billion beats in a lifetime, whatever it is. And you just... You don't, even, you don't hear it beating. You, we don't even acknowledge it. Unless we get in a funny position on the pillow and we wonder what that thump thump is. Uh, so it's in a lot of muscle fibers inside the heart that are also fed with tiny, tiny arteries. Let's look, look. So we've got the, the big ones, the, the coronary arteries, the ones that like come over the side of the heart. Those are the ones that the bypass surgeon has fixed. I'm trying to remember some of the names. Anyway, the coronary arteries. What do they do? They're bringing energized oxygen in their blood to thousands of little arteries inside the heart that control the way for the muscles. That things that open and close, this amazing routine. If we've got stuff building up and the size, you know, the one the size of your little finger, 
and you know from physics that the size of a lumen just changes radically. If you just open it up a tiny bit, you got so much more volume. Okay, we're now down inside the heart. This is something the size of a piece of dental floss. Where is the cholesterol? Where is the coronary artery disease there? And what does it take to really begin to compromise the heart? Yes, the big coronary arteries that are feeding the blood. But all the muscles within the heart itself need to get oxygen, glycogen, and food to do all that stuff inside sort of the classic shape of the heart. There's so much going on. Why load up that that's the size of a piece of dental force at the same time? You're giving that an incredibly remarkable organ a really hard time. Um, base. Fragile planet. My late wife made our, made our family, I did not become a vegetarian. Our family became a veg, veg, vegetarian family, but she cooked. The fall of 1972. I don't think I've had enough meat since the fall of 1972. I've cheated. I often get the job of carving turkey. And if you're serving this way with your left hand, you can get a good piece of dark meat. <laughs> so I've, I've gotten my share over the years. But essentially, meat-free for whatever it is, 60 years ago. Um, everything still works. Um, in 2005, I read a book called The China Study recommended by my brother, who's done a great deal of hard research. There was a question in my mind going forward after reading the China study. Uh, I'm trying to remember the average cholesterol in China, now this is 40 years ago. Um, Something like 130, 140. Where today, American, many doctors use, well, you're a Peter, you're 200. Well, moms are under 200. 200 to 150 is a zone where all kinds of heart attacks occur. Okay, and we know the below 150, they don't occur. What am I missing here? Why can't we just say, let's prevent, let's stop, get it down below 150? Okay. Um. Eric, I have a question. What about rice and grains? Rice. Rice. I got it. You got to say the thing. What about rice, barley? Is there any? I'm not that tuned into gluten. So, oh, okay. But a lot of money is being made, and I have a lot of stuff legitimately is being, people are tuned into it. Yeah. And there's, if, if you have whatever the disease is behind the sensitivity, uh, to gluten. Uh, no, it's, um, it's, it's pay it's attention. But, good lord. There's nothing wrong with good bread and buns and pasta and if it's going to be plastic, get the brown pasta, get, get the whole wheat. Okay. Time for the visual A. <laughs> okay. Nothing in a box. Uh, obviously, you notice that I occasionally exaggerate. But essentially, processed food, if, you, if it sounds like a chem class, your body's not used to handling it. 
Read the labels. Whatever you do, read the labels. If it's a chem class, try to find another way around it. I picked up this because it's a classic. If another gem, or, or the, if you go into the big, I don't know, it's, um, Whole Foods or something, there's a big section of sushi prepared every day, prepared every day in Columbus, Georgia, if you look at the label. Mm -hmm. And the label is about 18 inches long. Mm -hmm. And that's a PhD chem class. <laughs> it's true. Barber's shredded wheat. Ingredients it's on the bottom. I'm going to pass this around. This is a whole food. Eric, Eric, um, you know what, um, there was a saying that um, if you eat cereal from a cereal box, uh, you should eat the box for fiber, and that's the only <laughs> thing that you're going to get. That was the famous Harvard study. Literally, yeah, I know. There was more says. nutrition in the cardboard <laughs> than there were. <laughs> Eric. Can you take psyllium seed as a part of a fiber? Sure, as a, okay. you could. It's easy I, it, It's there, it's available, you can I'd probably get it downstairs, I'm <laughs> sure. My sense is that the, the, the veggies themselves, oh. because it's textured into so much more stuff, um, the micronutrients, and the, what are generally called phytochemicals, mm -hmm. the stuff that's in a plant, is there are 60 different things when you eat a red pepper. And to, to get your fiber within that amazingly rich mix of stuff, it just seems like a bonus if you want to Get psyllium seed, and that can make a difference. Sure, I, uh, but more in the natural state. The, the more you just get it from real food. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I think the better better off you are. Okay. What about um, um, what Magdalena? About there are certain voices <laughs> that are, are just don't hear. What about cooked vegetables? Cooked greens. Okay, they're fascinating. There's some vegetables that actually give you more vitamins when they're cooked, and a lot of have sustained more vitamins and phytochemicals, phytonutrients. You know, if they're not cooked, it varies. Um, you can you can get that information, but I think raw, <laughs> if you can handle it, 
I'm not a raw foods buff at all. Selena makes, and Barbara knows this, <laughs> vegetarian. I said, well, heck, no. <laughs> it's delicious. No. <laughs> this lady was at our home for lunch on okay. Sunday, a big birthday party. Beautiful. And Selena prepared um, for some. I don't want to say they're picking eaters, but they were some of the folks there were a little touchy. And I think they were quite surprised. They're yes, just, yes. A person who I know is a meat eater and a fish eater, and by God. He said the, the best the vegetable lasagna ever. Did you put so it just cheese? Off her chair. This was a very, very meticulous woman about food. This is the most delicious food I've ever had. No milk. No, maybe there might have been a little cheese on top of that lasagna. A vegetarian lasagna with probably 12 different vegetables. There were artichoke carts in it. I remember that. Yeah, and peppers and zucchini. And the whole wheat um, lasagna strips or whatever they're called. The fiber part, the uh, pasta part. Um, yeah, well, I think cooking enhances the, the health value of some, and raw does quite well on the others. Um, books, they're like probiotics. Go to the cookbook section of a big books a million or one of those great big bookstores. The nearest one used to be in Hanover. 60 feet of cookbooks. Just like probiotics. Cookbooks for the golfer. Cookbooks for the life cookbooks, cookbooks for the people in menopause. Cookbooks for those over 60. They're wonderful books that I can give you information about plant-based nutrition. Uh, one that I like is the Whole Foods cookbook. The fellow who started Whole Foods, oh. whose name I've forgotten at the moment, uh, he's put out with some excellent support from two co-authors who are physicians of the Whole Foods cookbook. An introduction about heart disease uh, and just not just recipes but the reasons behind this kind of eating. Uh, if you want to jump into the deep end of the pool, uh, this book, and I think they're all available probably at Bear Pond, How Not to Die. Hmm. What a crazy title. <laughs> what a crazy title. Go to How Not to Die on Google. This is a guy who's settled totally by a foundation. He's not making a penny off this stuff. How Not to Die. And amazing recipes in the book itself. Uh, it'll all seem why did I ever do that? <laughs> Why did I ever eat that way when I was 30? And once you turn into Alzheimer's, once you turn into heart health and brain health, and just understanding what's going to keep all those bad guys out of your system. Hmm. I have a question. What do you, here we go. Just, well, this is, you know when when you have to get a colonoscopy, they make you drink this stuff. Now, does that take away the lining of your intestine, your big a intestine? Colonoscopy? A colonoscopy? Yeah. You mean it all the it's, a, it's a sodium something solution. Yeah. It chases everything out. Okay. Does it keep your mucus lining? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, that is a good question. I, I know a, a colonoscopy too, but you know, maybe yeah. a little smaller in your thumb. 
I can't help but sense that it disrupts things. I would say and probably. Yeah. It probably there are different variations on how far in they go, but if it gets up into the distal third, the the decent They usually go to the cecum. The cecum, which is where your appendix is. Well which is right at the crossroads of the small and the wide. That's a, Oh, all the way around. That's a. Anyway. No, I'm sorry. That's a trip. Oh. Okay. I can't help but feel yeah. that it must not make the mucus wall feel super good. These are tiny, tiny, thin, thin uh, walls. But that was not your question. Your question was what happens when you have to take. When you have to drink all that stuff to clean yourself out, is that no? Not the question was, you, when you drink that, right. will that affect your colon wall and get rid of some of the mucus lining? It, it, which, which we don't know. I right. probably it, need to go. I would assume. Yes. yes, it would compromise it probably. I, I would assume yes. Yeah. All right. So what are we going to do the, after we have that? We're going to go to Ezra's. The cafe because it's vegan and it's really good. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're going to get. It's in Indianapolis. That's where I go. <laughs> yeah. But give it the the non digestible fiber that yeah. the bacteria are going to, and they'll rebuild that wall. I'm talking as if they were old friends. <laughs> oh, they, are. they are. They are. They are. Thank you. Not necessary question. <laughs> Anyway, this is the first time I've ever tried this. And I just really appreciate your coming. Oh. And uh, if I can answer any specific questions or at all. I just wanted to recommend the China study. Um, I, I read it years ago. I got it out of the library. Um, I think it was after a workshop here that Linda Mulliver, was her name at the time, did on raw foods. She did a lot of workshops. Um, and so I read that. and. His brother is figures prominently in this book, and mm -hmm. when I first met Eric, I said, "Are you related to the Dr. Esselstyn and uh, the China study?" And he went, <laughs> "How do you know about that?" And I said, "Well, I got it out of the library, I read it." And he said, "Yes, that's my brother." So, um, but it reads—it's uh, it, a really good read. It's, it's technical in many respects, but it's also really entertaining and interesting, and informative, mm -hmm. and uh, I I'd highly recommend it. Thank you all for coming. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.